Please notice who is writing. If it were John that said this, we wouldn't be at all surprised because John was a great apostle of love. If he had said that love was the greatest, well, of course, you would understand. You would expect that from John. But Paul is writing. And Paul wrote so much in all of his writings about faith. And yet in this 13th verse, he says that love is greater even than faith. And so when Paul says it, you'd better believe it. Love is the greatest. Now you remember our definitions. Sin, we are saying, is simply self-centeredness. All sin is selfishness. All selfishness is sin. Love, on the other hand, is other-centeredness. We studied last time in verse 4, five characteristics of Christian love. This morning we find nine more. And in order to kind of put everything in a capsule, let's read all nine together before we look at each one individually. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5, 6, and 7. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now, first of all, we notice in verse 5 that other-centeredness makes us nice to be around. The very first part of the verse, doth not behave itself unseemly. That is, it is not rude or discourteous. Now, courtesy, especially Christian courtesy, is something that used to be emphasized quite a bit more than it is today. Courtesy is not a very popular word today. We hear so much more about road rage today than we do about courteous drivers. People in general talking rudely to each other, texting rudely to each other. We hear about cyberbullying. But Christian courtesy is more than just manners. It runs deeper than that. It is motivated by love. When you were young, did you ever hear dad or mom say, you know, I wish you'd just grow up? Won't you just grow up? You know what a mother tree says to the little ones? Oh, how I wish you'd grow down. Because a tree knows that unless there are strong, deep roots underneath, when the storm comes, there won't be any strength on top. When the drought comes, as we experience here in Arizona, there's no ability to overcome that drought, to overcome adversity. I always think it's kind of interesting listening to a customer service representative who's under a little bit of pressure or who's frustrated with a customer. You know, maybe someone at one of the utility companies or maybe the post office where I used to work or a clerk at a store. Someone who has been carefully trained that the customer is always right. Or as I used to always believe, the customer is always important. Not always right, but always important. Trained to be always courteous in every situation. And yet, when you scratch beneath the surface just a little bit, 
Sometimes there's not very much under it. You see, initially, maybe a little bit of a defensive posture. And then maybe a loss of patience. And then maybe it turns a bit argumentative and maybe even anger. Now, Christian courtesy is not just a thing that's on the surface. It goes down deep. It is anchored deep in love. It helps us to be thoughtful of people even when the wind begins to blow. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Continuing in our verse, seeketh not her own. That is, it doesn't insist on its own way. Oh, I'm different from all the rest of you. I'm tempted to want my own way. In fact, I'm so bad that I am tempted to dislike people that disagree with me. I'm inclined to think that there are just two ways, my way and the wrong way. You ever know someone who thought or acted that way? That's not a Christian attitude. Christianity does not insist on its own way. And the goal of the Christian is to leave not skid marks, but footprints on the road of life. Seeketh not her own. Next is not easily provoked. That is, love isn't touchy. Anybody here touchy? Remember those mines that they used to plant in the ocean during the time of war? It is estimated that during the Second World War, over a million naval mines were employed. And they had these tentacles that would stick out in all directions. And you just touch one of those tentacles, a boat, something passing by would touch one of those tentacles. It would set it off and it would explode. It is estimated that many thousands of those are still in the ocean today and are still viable. People are sometimes like that. We put out our tentacles. And if anybody happens to touch us, we just blow up. She didn't speak to me. Or he did say something about me and you should have heard what awful things he had to say. Or they didn't sit by me. Brethren and sisters, bitterness does not come from what happens to us. If you have bitterness in your heart this morning, it's not because of external conditions. Bitterness comes because of the way we choose to think about what has happened to us. Love is not touchy, is not easily provoked. And then the last part of that verse, thinketh no evil. That is, love is not resentful. Love doesn't keep score. Love doesn't bear a grudge. If you have been hurt, my friend, and who has not? If you have been hurt, you want to be healed from that hurt. But our natural human instinct is to do the very thing that keeps us from being healed from that hurt. If you have been hurt, you will never recover from it fully until you can forgive the people who hurt you. Hate destroys the hater. And when you are pointing at an enemy, that person has come between you and God. And if that person is between you and God, that person is closer to God than you are. And so here in verse 5, there are four things that are described that are not very nice. Being rude, insisting on our own way, being touchy, being resentful, 
Paul is saying those are all just the opposites of love. That other-centeredness makes us nice to be around. Now in the next verse, Paul suggests that other-centeredness looks for the good in other people. Verse 6, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Now love gets its kicks out of good. And I would like our young people especially to notice that word rejoiceth. It's there twice. There are some young people that think there simply isn't any rejoicing in Christ, that somehow Christianity is a boring way to live your life. There is a lot of excitement out there in the world. But listen, Paul is telling us here that love can be very exciting. Love is more than an emotion, but love does include emotion. And if you have tried Christianity and have not found that it really was filled you with pleasure and excitement, it's because you've only tried it halfway. The halfway Christian is turned off to the pleasures of sin, but he just isn't turned on to the pleasures of Christ. Now what you need to do is not get rid of Christianity. Instead, you need to go all the way and find the rejoicing, the joy, the pleasure, the fun that can be found in serving Christ all the way. Jesus tells us in John 15, verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Galatians 5, 22, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is first of all love, because love is the greatest. The very next thing, joy. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. When I grew up here in this church, we had as our theme song for Sabbath school, a song that I probably haven't sung since, but it stuck with me because it was our theme song for years and years. And it goes like this, Jesus is the joy of living. He's the king of life to me. Unto him my all I'm giving, his forevermore to be. I will do what he commands me, anywhere he leads I'll go. Jesus is the joy of living, he's the dearest friend I know. Joy can be found, true joy can be found in serving Christ all the way. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the tr truth. Real love gets its kicks out of good. Sin is excited by bad. Love is excited by good. Self-centeredness makes me go behind a man and say, I know something bad about him. Love, other-centeredness, makes me walk up to that man and say, I know something good about you. A florist was sitting in his office, and all of a sudden, a loud electric bell went off. It kind of startled a customer. Excuse me, said the florist, and he disappeared back into the greenhouse. He came back a little later. He said, sorry, that was my frost bell. The fires had burned down in the greenhouse, and it's set so that if the temperature gets to a certain point, the bell goes off, and then I'm able to respond and adjust the heating and perhaps save myself thousands of dollars. Have you ever wondered if there's a bell that goes off to let us know when our Christian experience is getting cold? There is. It's when we get excited over the bad. 
That's the warning of a cold experience. I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a negative Christian. Sometimes people who think they're the most religious can talk about nothing but bad in the church around them, can talk nothing about bad in the community, always dwelling on the negative. When our minds dwell upon what's bad around us, and the bad is always there, it's a sign, just like the frost bell going off, that our Christian experience is getting cold. Because love rejoices not in iniquity, it gets its kicks out of good. And now let's look at verse 7. Beareth all things. Now this one is a little harder to interpret. Linguistic scholars can't be quite positive what Paul means by this. It means to cover or to conceal the bad. Literally, it means overroofeth. Overroofeth. Overroofeth the bad. Now, usually during the daylight hours, I'm out in my garden working. That's my favorite place to be. A number of years ago, I had a very large redwood greenhouse in the middle of my garden. And the reason I don't have it today is because I built it. I'm a lot better gardener than I am at construction. And the thing was starting to do all this kind of swaying and I was really afraid we we're gonna be all underneath it and one day it was gonna come down on a bunch of people. So I had to take it down. But I used to enjoy working even when the rains come. Like now you can start seeing the clouds just starting to appear, you know, in the afternoons. And I understand starting today and for the next week, we have better chances of rain. But I used to enjoy being out there, you know, when the clouds come and you can kind of smell the rain in the air a little bit and I'm out there working and it cools down a little bit and then all of a sudden the rain just pours down and if I'm out there close to the gazebo I could just run right underneath it and get cover and I used to enjoy that so much because I could be out there surrounded by the beautiful rain and yet stay dry. I was completely dry. But then when I got out and looked at the roof, the roof had become wet because it had been over roofing me. Now the business of the roof is to keep me dry, but you can't keep me dry without the roof getting wet. Now here, I believe, is one of the characteristics of Christian love. Christian love stands between the accused and the accuser. And sometimes there's no way you can do that without winding up being accused yourself. Example, a student cheats in class. And the teacher is forced to give that student a low grade because of it. And the student's friend comes in and just works the teacher over good. But the teacher just grins and bears it rather than telling the friend that the other student is a cheater. That is what Paul is talking about. Beareth all things, overroofing all things, protecting the reputation of others, even if we get a little wet ourselves. Why? Because we're other-centered. Verse 7 again, believeth all things. That is, Christian love prefers to believe the good. Self-centeredness finds bad even when there isn't any bad. Do you know what a taxidermist is? Taxidermists will take an animal that is deceased and they'll take and clean it up and they'll stuff it 
you know, with proper stuffing, and it'll make it look as realistic as possible. Maybe put in some glass eyes and have the animal where it can be preserved. Well, a young taxidermy apprentice was walking with a friend down the street one day when he came to another taxidermy shop, a different one from where he worked. And there in the window was an owl. And he pulled his friend over and he said, you'll notice this owl isn't done properly. This taxidermist apparently doesn't know his business. You'll notice that the pose is very unnatural. The head isn't right. You notice especially that the eyes are the wrong color. You've got to get the right colored eyes. And just then the owl turned its head. <laughs> you see, self-centeredness finds bad even when none exists. Every man, woman, and child on this earth is a mixture of part bad and part good, but which you look for depends on you and not upon them. And Paul says it's significant of Christian love. It prefers to believe the good. Now you have two birds that are flying over the countryside. The same countryside. There's a hummingbird. And there's a vulture. Same countryside. When the hummingbird is flying over that piece of property... What is it looking for? It's looking for beauty. It's looking for sweetness. It's looking for flowers, a source of nectar. Over the very same piece of property, the vulture flies. And what is it looking for? Flowers? I don't think so. It's looking for an animal that might be weak or struggling. It may be looking for death. Christian love looks for the good. It believes the good. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Other-centeredness hopes for good even when it isn't very evident. His wife was an alcoholic and she was continually an embarrassment to her husband and to the whole family. And one evening at a party, she made a real fool of herself and she really embarrassed her husband. And afterwards, she realized what she had done and she felt so ashamed. And the tears just came streaming down. She says, why don't you just leave me? He said, I will not leave you. Because I remember something that's beautiful in you. And I believe that it's still there. That's Christian love. Christian love sees people not so much as they are, but as they can become. And that is what helps them become what they can be. God sees me exactly as I am, warts and all. He loves me anyway. He keeps loving me. He never stops loving me. He never stops forgiving me when I fall. He keeps believing in me, keeps hoping that I will change. Love believes all things. It hopes all things. Verse 7, one more time. Endureth all things. Jerusalem Bible says, endure whatever comes. I wonder if it's possible you came to worship this morning being a little disappointed. Maybe in yourself. Maybe you've suffered real disappointment in your vocation, your life work. Maybe you've been disappointed with your friends. 
may be disappointed in your spouse, may be disappointed in your children. Maybe you've suffered severe disappointment over your health and you come to worship today disappointed. Listen, if you love God, if you love your fellow man, if you love and believe in yourself, there isn't anything you cannot face. And the promise of love is not that all of these negative things will simply go away, but that along with love, we can endure. Love endures all things. It endures whatever comes. Well, other-centeredness, as Paul describes it, is a beautiful thing, isn't it? How in the world could I have it in my experience? I want love. I want Christian love. But I, I find myself so short. I'm so far from it, this ideal. I can't do it. Where do you find that kind of love? Christian love comes only from God. is demonstrated on Calvary. First John, the fourth chapter in the 19th verse, we love him because he first loved us. We love because he loved first. Love begets love. And when I see love demonstrated so clearly, so powerfully at Calvary, it resurrects a glimmering spark of love within me. A lady by the name of Maud Fraser, back in 1911, wrote a hymn that demonstrates this so well. She wrote, when I see my Savior hanging on Calvary, bearing there for sinners bitterest agony, gratitude overwhelms me, makes mine eyes grow dim. All my ransom being captive is to him. I can see the blood drops red neath his thorny crown from the cruel nail wounds now they are falling down. Lord, when I would wander from thy love away, let me see those blood drops shed for me that day. We love him because he first loved us. God is the only one who loves without a because. God loves in spite of. Human beings seem capable, at the beginning at least, of loving only because of. We need a reason to love. And when we see how much he loved us, then we begin to love back. When I look at Calvary, my self-centeredness seems so cheap. I look at his love that he's expressed in my life and I say thank you Jesus I want to love you the way you love me and Jesus looks down and he says great Steve but I'm up here and you're down there and you need to love right where I've placed you and I say Lord I don't find people all that easy to love I'd rather love you Jesus smiles patiently and he says, all right, for beginners, you then just try loving the part of me that is in every person. Love is the greatest. Love makes us nice to be around. My family used to live in a Seventh-day Adventist college town. And the community there was about a half hour drive from a huge metropolitan area. And for a while, it got to be quite a thing to write newspaper articles about those 70 Adventists that live in that little community. Articles in the big city papers. 
talking about the church. And then to our little town went an Associated Press reporter wanting to write a story about the community. And we tend to get a little embarrassed the way most of those stories come out. We're a little apprehensive, like what angle are they going to use? How are they going to portray our church? Hopefully in a very positive way. But usually it seems they don't get really a true picture of the church or of the community in just the short visit. Typically they would write, you know, Adventists don't do this or they don't do that. Or they would write that we're different than most. Protestants, or that we're quaint, or that we're conservative, maybe that we're vegetarians, or maybe even that we're controversial. Well, brethren and sisters, when their stories come out, I wish that they could write that we're loving. Perhaps that's just not what they're looking for. Perhaps that's not how you sell newspapers. But I cannot help but believe that if it were more true, it would be more noticed. How about our church? Don't you think that the Sierra Vista Seventh-day Adventist Church ought to be the most loving church in all of town? Christian love makes us nice to be around. It helps us to see the good in others. It's the answer to every single need we possess. But man is incapable of that kind of love. Please don't just say, okay, now I'm going to leave here and I'm going to start loving. That kind of love must begin at Calvary. It must come from God. The truth of the matter is, for the realist, 1 Corinthians 13 can be very, very discouraging. There are some folk who read 1 Corinthians 13 and say, isn't that beautiful? And it is. But that's when you're not really actually applying it to yourself. When you take off your shoes and get into 1 Corinthians 13 yourself and compare it to your life, the tears begin to come because how can you be real without realizing that we're so far away from the ideal? I can't do it, not in my own self, not in my own will. True love can only come from God. A family was visiting Carlsbad Caverns. They were on a guided tour to the lower cave. And Carlsbad Caverns is my favorite caverns that I've been to. Gone there quite a few times. The family, the grandkids. The regular tour, usually we take most of a day. We take our flashlights, and I like just being able to take my time and go down and look at the different formations and just really soak it all in. Where I have not gone is in one of the special tours that you can go on. And this family was going on one of the guided tours to the lower cave where you go in groups of 10 or less with a guide, and you go down to where nobody else gets to go. It's only these special few on the special tour. And some of those formations, from what I've seen, are just absolutely spectacular and pristine. Well, this family got way down there in the depths of the cave, and the guide turned off the light. Way down, way into the bowels of the cave, where no light could penetrate. So dark, you could just almost feel the darkness, the blackness. The little girl started to cry, and she was frightened, and she squeezed her big brother's hand. And her brother said, oh, don't cry, sis. The guide has the light, and he will turn it on if you will just ask him. He knows the way. As you today look at 1 Corinthians 13, if you see that you fall so far short, if your life seems dark and gloomy, if it seems joyless, even depressed, 
Don't worry. Don't fret. Don't despair. The master guide, the man of Calvary, has the light. He is the light. He knows the way. He is the way. He is the source of love. He is love. As we close our worship today, I ask every worshiper, hold tightly to his hand. Let him turn on the light of love in your life. God is love.